Okay, question number 25. An empty container has a capacity of 80,000 litres to one significant figure. Mel pours in 7,400 litres of water to two significant figures. And she says, I have filled more than 10% of the container. Is she correct? And we need to show our work in. Okay, so first of all, let's work out the low and the upper bound for each of these. So for an empty container that's a capacity of 80,000 litres to one significant figure, the lower bound is going to be 75,000. And the upper bound is going to be 85,000. Okay, and Mel pours in 7,400 litres of water to two significant figures. So the lower bound here is going to be 7,350 because the t two significant figures that would round to 7,400 and, um, and the upper bound is going to be 7,450. Okay. Um, and even though that would round to 7,500, we still call that the upper bound. Okay, so the lower bound and our upper bound. Okay, she says, I have filled more than 10% of the container, and we need to decide if she is correct. So in the best case scenario, so that she fills the highest percentage, we want to use the um, the biggest version of the number of litres she's poured into the smallest version of the container. So that's going to be this number divided by this number, the upper bound divided by the lower bound, and that's going to give us the highest possible answer. So um, we're going to do 7450 divided by 75,000 okay and that's going to give me 7450 divided by 75 and that gives me 0 0.0993 recurring 0 0.099 etc. Okay so as a percentage I want to now times that by a hundred and that gives me 9.933 percent 9.93 percent two decimal places um, has been filled. Now remember this is the best case scenario because we use the the highest version of the um, water um, being poured and the lowest capacity of the container and that will give us the highest percentage and that is less than 10% so 9.93 is less than 10 so um, is what's her name Mel so Mel is incorrect. Okay, Mel is incorrect, and I should have written that there. There we go, Mel is incorrect. Okay, question 26. A bag contains 12 discs. Seven are red, three are blue, two are yellow. Two discs are taken from the bag at random without replacement, we need to work out the probability that the two discs are the same colour. Okay, so we could draw a probability tree diagram for this, and in fact we will Let's draw a probability tree diagram. So um, we've got red, blue and yellow, so there's three branches like this, and then let's do another three branches.
OK, and we're going to have red, blue, yellow, red, blue, yellow, red, blue, yellow, red, blue, yellow. OK, so these are going to be all of our possible outcomes. There's nine different ones, red, 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 blue, red, yellow, blue, red, blue, 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 yellow, yellow, red, yellow, blue, yellow, yellow. They're all the possible outcomes that can happen. Okay, we know that there's 12 discs, so the probability of me picking a red is going to be 7 twelfths. So I'm going to put 7 twelfths on this branch here. Blue is going to be 3 twelfths, and yellow is going to be 2 twelfths. Okay, so if I go down this branch here, that means that a red has been picked out now. So because I'm taking two discs at random, I'm, t I'm imagining this has taken a first disc, and I should label this up really, so this is going to be my first disc, and over here is going to be my second disc. So this column represents my first disc, and this column here represents my second disc. Okay, so um, if I've picked out a red disc, that means that there's now going to be 11 left. again okay so that's going to be 11 left um, and I've taken a red disc less so there's only going to be six red discs left so that's going to be six elevens okay um, and there's still going to be three blue ones left so that's going to be three elevens and there's still going to be two yellow ones left and that's going to be two elevens okay so that's six elevens three elevens two elevens if I've already picked a red one out if I've already picked a blue one out, so if I go down this path, then that means that there's not going to be three left anymore. There's only going to be two blue ones left. So there's still seven red ones left. So that's going to be seven elevenths, two elevenths, and then two elevenths. The number of yellow discs hasn't changed. If I take a yellow one out, um, there'll be 11 discs left. Um, still seven red, still three blue, but only one yellow now. So that's going to be seven elevenths, three elevenths, and one eleventh. Okay, so um, we need to work out the probability that the two discs are the same colour. So I need the probability of red followed by red. I want the probability of blue followed by blue, and I want the probability of yellow followed by yellow. So red followed by red is going to be 7 twelfths times 6 elevenths. Blue followed by blue is going to be 3 twelfths times 2 elevenths. And Yellow followed by yellow is going to be 2 twelfths times 1 eleventh. So that's going to give me 42 132. 3 twelfths times 2 eleventh is going to be equal to 6 132. And 2 twelfths times 1 eleventh is going to be equal to 2 132. So um, for two discs um, being the same colour, then I need to add all of these together. So I've got 42 132s plus 6 132s plus 2 132s, and that's going to be equal to 48 50 132s. So my answer is going to be 50, 132. So I could simplify that to 25, 66. OK. Question 27. Sam runs for 10 minutes. The graph shows his pulse in beats per minute. So that's his beats per minute. And, and on this axis, we've got the time in minutes. 
uh, by drawing a tangent we need to work out the rate at which his pulse is increasing after three minutes and we need to give units for our answer as well so if I read up here for three minutes and um, what I'm trying to do is draw a tangent at that point there so I'm going to try and do the best that I can with this let's get a thin line And we want a tangent at that point there at three minutes. Okay, and that looks like it's about right. Okay, right, so so that's my tangent. And um, to work out the rate um, at which the pulse is increasing, we need to work out the gradient of this tangent here. So I'm going to draw, if I turn this into a triangle, let's choose that value there. Okay, right, so um, this here goes from 130 to um, 97 so that's got a height of 33 so the change in y is 33 the change in beats per minute and over here this goes from um, 0 0.6 to 4.2 so if we do 4.2 take away 0 0.6 and that's going to give me 3.6 so my calculation here is going to be 33 divided by 3.6 and that gives me 9 point we're going to call it 9.2 so we've done 33 divided by 3.6 and that gives me 9.2 okay and it says give the units of your answer so this here was in beats per minute and this here was in minutes so my unit is going to be beats per minute per minute because that's the calculation we've done that divided by that beat per minute per minute so I could say beats per minute per minute is the same as beats per minute squared that's going to be my units okay Question 28, this is the final question. Question 28a, here is a triangle ABC. We need to describe fully a single transformation of the triangle for which all points on BC are invariant and that there are no other invariant points. So, so when we say invariant, what we're saying is that we want all of the points on the line BC to stay where they are. So the only way that we're going to achieve that is if we have um, a reflection in the line along here okay so in the line um, this line here is y equals 1 if we reflect in y equals 1 the points along BC are going to stay where they are so let's just draw in that reflection so we can see that the image of A is going to be down here and there we go okay so the points BC actually stay exactly where they are okay so our answer for that first one is going to be um, a reflection in y equals 1 that's the line y equals 1 okay part B we've got an L shape here and we need to describe fully a single transformation of the L shape for which only one vertex is invariant. We also want the line joining P, Q to remain vertical and the area of the L shape 
doesn't change. Okay, so it can't be an, an enlargement because the area of the L shape doesn't change. If we want um, only one vertex to be invariant, that means that um, it also can't be a reflection because we would have a line of invariant points and it can't be a translation because um, we can't have any invariant points in a translation because all of the points would move. So the only thing left is a rotation and a rotation has a center of rotation which will be an invariant point. So um, we can choose any point that we want to be our um, invariant point, so our center of rotation. So I'm going to choose point Q. Okay, so we're going to rotate around that point there. And because I want PQ to remain vertical, I'm going to have to rotate this 180 degrees. Okay, and then that will turn that PQ around and it will be facing this way instead. So um, we're going to have a rotation of 180 degrees about the point 1, 1. And that's going to satisfy all of these. Okay, that was the last question on the paper. I hope you found that useful. Thanks very much for joining me. I'll see you next time.